Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I can see we have quite a few participants online already. We'll just give it uh, another another moment or two uh, to allow the remaining participants to join, and then we'll go ahead and get started. So thank you to everyone who is here already. Hello, Helen. Hello, welcome. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we can go ahead and get started. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to, to everyone who's here. I can see we have people joining joining us from around the world. So we're very happy to have you all here for the last mile delivery webinar. Uh, this is the first webinar that the UPU is organizing on this topic. And I think it's a, a really important one and a really exciting one uh, with many, many developments to hear about. So before we get started, I'd like to take you through the objectives for the meeting today. Uh, Odd, if you can please uh, go to the next slide. Uh, so our our two main objectives, uh, first of all, are to to learn about innovations from from different posts and different organizations uh, relating to the last mile delivery. We have many exciting projects. Uh, that are being developed by by different UPU members. And uh, I think what's really interesting is that uh, even if it's a project you may know about, uh, there are many different ways to implement it or maybe different methods that are being used. And there is therefore something for, for everyone to learn from, uh, from each of the posts and organizations that would be presenting. Uh, another objective is to, to share the best practices so we can hear about what worked and uh, maybe some challenges that were encountered and, and how those were overcome in implementing various projects. Uh, so we, we hope to be able to, to do that today. And finally, we'd like to be able to connect posts with one another. Uh, we will uh, be able to, to hear from just a few posts today, a few organizations and, and how they're implementing projects, but you may learn something or hear something that you'd like to have more details about. And we'd like to be able to, to facilitate those connections for, our, for all of the UPU members so that you can get in touch with one another to, to learn about those uh, best practices and experiences. Uh, if we can just take a look at the agenda for today's meeting, uh, we'll be starting out uh, with a presentation from Post Malaysia um, about the sustainability in the last mile. Uh, we'll then be hearing from ACSL about their drone delivery project with Japan Post. A little bit later on, we'll hear about informed delivery, an interesting project from uh, USPS. And finally, we'll be hearing uh, about the challenges in the last mile delivery and the use of parcel lockers um, from Cojeos do Brasil and how they've been uh, implementing this within Brazil. And uh, on the organizational side, I would ask everyone to keep their, their microphones muted. At the end of each session, we'll have a chance for Q&A. Um, so if uh, at that time, you'll be able to, to raise your hand or you can put a, a question into the, into the chat uh, so that we can share them with the speakers. Um, and we'll let you know when it's, when it's time to do that. So without much further ado, I would like to uh, hand over the floor to Mr. Jared Ho from Post Malaysia to hear about their implementation um, of electric vehicles within their delivery fleet. So Jared, thank you for joining us and you have the floor. 
Hi, Heather. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good evening. Uh, well, it's evening for me here. And uh, good morning to everyone else there. Yeah. So, um, before I begin, I would like to just share a bit of myself here. My name is Jared Hall. Um, I am currently the head of sustainability for Post Malaysia. Yeah. And for Post Malaysia, we are the postal operator for Malaysia, uh, for, for Malaysia. And in case you're wondering where Malaysia is, um, it's it's in Southeast Asia and uh it's in between Singapore and Thailand. Yeah. So if you can see the picture here, the first first page there. That's the, the iconic Petronas Twin Tower located just a couple of minutes away from our uh, headquarters. Yeah. So if you have the chance to come and visit Malaysia, just feel free just to let me know. All right, next, next slide. So a bit of history of post-Malaysia with, um, with a history of more than 200 years um, for post-Malaysia, we are the uh, National Postal Company of Malaysia. With a uh, in and in Malaysia we have a population of about thirty million people, and it has evolved from a traditional mail company to a comprehensive logistics powerhouse, serving as uh, the leading postal service in Malaysia, uh, serving more than eleven million addresses every day. So what we have here is that we have more than 15,000 workforce and a fleet size of over 7,000 vehicles. It consists of bikes, vans, and also heavy vehicles like prime movers. Next slide. And that that's comes to um, a big problem here because as we talk about delivery services, each item deliver actually leaves a trace on our planet, which is the carbon footprint which we can no longer ignore. And the trans transportation sector has always been the second most significant contributor to carbon emission behind the energy sector, not only in Malaysia, but also around the world. So here, hence the logistics and uh, postal industry stands at the forefront of a monumental shift where each of the each of our each of the packages that we deliver can either contribute to the problem or become part of a grand solution for sustainability. Next. So in post Malaysia, um, what we, we are doing is that what our man we have we have been mandated to address this with um uh, urgency and innovation. In early 2023, we we officially made a commitment and to have launched our sustainability roadmap committing to net zero by 2050. So this path, this pathway to net zero are supported by six distinct work streams, which is uh, delivery methods. This, this one is talking about ele the electrification of our vehicles, last, particularly on last mile vehicles. Fleet optimization is more on finding ways to increase efficiency of our vehicles and therefore reducing the carbon footprint. And green buildings here is making sure that our logistics hubs are as energy efficiency as possible uh, uh, using technology like uh, building energy management systems or uh, solar panels. And in waste management, this is managing our operational waste from its inception to its final disposal. Um, uh, Eco-consumerism is about giving consumers a choice of a service that is less harmful to the environment. And lastly, it's about providing trainings digitally that will, that will future-proof our workforce. So these six work streams are the one that allow us to uh, set certain targets, uh, like for example, uh, so, uh, certain mid-term targets like reducing our scope one and scope two emission for 30% thirty percent uh, 30 from our baseline 2021 years. And also uh, making sure that all our pro products are contain at least 80% renewable uh, or recyclable inputs. Next one. And we, today I'm just going to focus more on the, the, the delivery methods and also how we use uh, the fleet, you know. So here is, which is where, this is where we are at the core of our journey, where um, 
in post Malaysia, it's not about just taking boxes or not just buying one one electric bike and just leave it there and, and showcase it to others. But it's about really steering the wheel of transformation. You know, excuse the pun, you know, for, for, for post Malaysia. And we are we're not just shifting gears and but we are really changing the vehicles from our current ICE vehicles to the electric um, solutions. So what we have done here is that we have begun rolling out uh, electric vehicles since February this year. Uh, start started off with uh two wheelers, two wheelers, and then uh four wheelers, which is the vans. Currently in uh post Malaysia, we are the largest electric vehicle fleet operator in Malaysia. We have uh about one hundred and nine electric bikes. Uh, we're gonna be reaching two hundred by end of the year, and then. Uh, 143 electric vans. So we already have plans for the next few years to 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 slowly replace our aging fleet. So this is a commitment, and we we would really love to actually make it work and to see by 2025, or sorry, 20, 2030, we will have all our last mile vehicles electrified. Yep. Next. Next. Um. Oh yeah, so this is this is just this is just a uh, a bit of um timeline of what we have done uh since this year. We have our first bike being flagged off in February, and then subsequently we have uh different different models of bikes. Right now we have we have two official mo uh, electric models running on the street right now, and we also um using three more um Testing out three more vehicles, three more bikes, uh, for for next year's orders, as well as also uh three more electric vans for next year's orders as well. So next year we we will be ordering um uh, we'll be replacing one hundred, uh one thousand two hundred electric bikes and also three hundred and fifty electric vans. Next, and not just on the electric vehicles. You know, and what goes hand in hand is what's inside the vehicles, where um telematics is the heart of our operation. This is where we talk about uh telematics being uh and route optimization being the blood of our oper uh, operations because it's the backbone of everything, right? Because even if we change all our vehicles to electric, if we do not change the way we drive it, uh our our consumptions, be it and energy uh be it electric or uh, petrol, would still be the same. So this is where we have set ourselves an, an ambitious target of equipping our fleet with telematics by 2030. So what are the key advantages next? Next slide, yeah. So um, so what, what are the key advantages is that um, First is definitely route, route optimization. You can maximize pickup and drop-off points and also improve drivers' behaviors. Uh, it also aims to um, we also aim to leverage the data to anticipate and schedule maintenance. It uh, it can also man minimize downtime and extending the the longevity of our fleet through um, predictive analysis. So this is where we we um we were able to know that okay um after X amount of mileage, we'll know when it, it can be um it is due for, for maintenance. Uh but importantly is that we have to acknowledge that this is a very dynamic and ongoing transformation with on currently only 26% of our vehicles equipped with this technology. But what we have found out is that uh in this 26% uh, percent of our vehicles, one of the key things that we can do is that we're able to save up to 10% of our uh, uh of our fuel just by reducing the idling time. Imagine that if you we just reduce the idling time, we can save 10% of our fuel, you know, without doing anything. Yeah. So this is where we um we know that by, by, by integrating these advanced telematics into our fleet, we can just we 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 can not, not just track vehicles, but we are really unlocking. Um, a new era of operational efficiency and cost reduction. So um, it can set new standards for logistics industries of, um, from, from, from there on as well. Yeah. 
next step, uh, next, next slide. So of course, um, oh, mm. um, well, maybe you can do just do just go to the next slide. Yeah. So um, for us, how well there's there's a lot of good things that we have um that I've spoken up just now, but um, I would say there are a lot of challenges that we have faced as well in especially in, 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 in this part of the world because um, first thing is that there is limited suppliers. You know, uh, We do not have a lot of uh, uh, models available here in Malaysia. And uh, even there are models, we have to go through a lot of processes where uh, every new model will, has to be approved by the minister um, Ministry of Transport before it can be Roll up to on the street. So what we have done is that we we still, I mean, I mean, what good th one good thing about this in post Malaysia is that we have uh our CEO who is very very sustainability conscious. So he just asks us to start off with everything with a proof of concept. This is where a crucial phase where we um we assess the operational uh suitability suitability of new technologies. And this is where we ask the pivotal questions. Um, is our operation ready for this technology? Or how do we familiarize our workforce with these new systems? Uh, um, what are the right specifications to meet our unique demands? And um, we have we have identified key areas of from of, for improvement in um, during this these POCs. So and, and we often would would welcome uh more uh, car manufacturers who want to embark on EVs to work with us as well because they would love to have the, the, the data as well, same like us, because we want to actually make sure that um, what, what they're offering really matches with our business operation. And finally, we have to, on our end, we need to perform a thorough total cost of ownership. So this is about... Uh, this is not about making hasty decision where, oh, because this is new, that's why I want to buy it. But it's about laying a solid foundation, building a solid business case for us to purchase. We So with total cost of ownership, we will know, okay, uh, previously I'm purchasing, for example, $50,000 uh, $50, uh, of, of, uh, for one vehicle. Now, for, for me to actually look into this, right? Um, yeah, it might have a, for, for me to replace the um, an ice van with a e EV van, um, I might need to fork out a higher initial cost. But somehow, if I do my total cost of ownership properly, I would know where's the best price for me to enter, where's the best price for me to purchase uh, an EV um electric van. So this is not just about um uh, TCO, but also uh transitioning and looking making me making sure the mindset is is ready especially for our employees so i've, I've spoken about limited suppliers uh, and also um, having the technology itself uh, requiring a significant upfront cost um well just just a fun fact here is that even the, even here in malaysia right um our petrol prices is one of the cheapest around the world it's less than uh, if I can do my conversion correctly, it's less than 50 cent US dollar per liter. But, but even that, it allows us to um, um, perform a total cost of ownership that is cost neutral, co uh, rich cost parity, you know, with, with, with EV. So because the savings of electricity, uh, of, of running on EV is much, much high, uh, much, much lower than on petrol. So what we need to do right now is to, 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 to do here, my, my, my sharing is more on, we need to actually try to start to do a lot of multiple scenarios and time frames to really find the best price to enter and look for areas that we can save money. And of course, there's some issues of range anxiety, which I think it doesn't really make sense for us because 
um, uh, um, for for a daily driver, we have already met uh, have 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 seen it, you know, and even have tested it and recorded. Our driver never go beyond uh hundred and fifty kilometers in a single day. So you just get it fully charged, do your pickup drop off, and then come back. It's less than hundred and fifty kilometers a day. So it's it it's we just need to make sure that you know we need to make sure that they are no longer thinking about having this this issue of range anxiety. And um with challenges comes with vast of opportunities, right? So uh, we've spoken about substantial fuel and energy savings. Um, so far, what we have done is that we have managed to to to, to match against um, uh, our fuel savings and uh, fuel fuel savings against uh, uh, our normal electric bikes and electric vans. The operational uh, cost of operations, right? It's it can save us more than more than forty to fifty percent, and that's that's just on operations. But what about spare parts? You know, EVs has less spare parts compared to uh, uh, the, the 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 normal um, uh, vehicles. Things like this will ultimately save save us even much more, much more. So um. It's it's all really about operational, uh, not just on operational change, but really, uh, a shift of our corporate identity and branding is really another opportunity that we have we have seen as well because, um, we are we are the largest electric op operator right now, electric vehicles operator right now. A lot of customers has began to come to us and say, hey, can we ship with you? Can we, uh, do some partnership with you because they themselves their business is about sustainability as well. And they wanted to partner with a delivery partner who shares the same view and shares the same objectives as theirs. Yeah, next. Next slide, please. Right. Okay. So as, as we approach uh, the conclusion of my presentation, um, let's come back to what we are doing. What's, what's, what's the... What's the value we can bring to our customers here? Yeah? Because um, this this whole journey does not end with just internal efficiency, because we need to be aware that our scope one and scope two is our customers' scope three. Yeah. So, um, next, next, yeah, that's that scope three. Yeah, and um, uh, oops. Anyway, um, we just want to make sure that that we are aware that the scope one and our scope one and scope two is our customer scope three, and what we need to do is that as we go along this, uh, this this journey, this electrification journey, or this sustainability journey, uh, what we are hoping to do is that what's next for us is that we will be measuring all this, and then um, we're able to provide our customers uh, the ability to measure the carbon footprint of their shipment with uh, with precision and also with reliability through our frameworks that we have adopted and also uh, the data the primary data and secondary data that we have we have we have gathered so far yeah and uh, I just uh, I'll end it with uh, sharing a short video of post Malaysia sustainability journey yeah. You can play the video. In the heart of Southeast Asia lies a country rich in natural beauty and biodiversity, Malaysia. A land where tradition marries modernity and where sustainability isn't just a trend, but a pledge to future generations. At the heart of this promise is Post Malaysia, an organization that has existed over the last two centuries, interwoven with the nation's fabric, now on a mission to redefine its legacy. Our operation touches over 11 million addresses, serving over 30 million Malaysians across the nation every day. And with this extensive reach, comes the responsibility to operate in harmony with the environment. 
aligned with national and global sustainability goals, both Malaysia is committed to achieving net zero emissions by the year 2050. In March 2023, we proudly launched our sustainability roadmap, demonstrating our full dedication to 30% reduction of our scope 1 and 2 carbon emissions by 2025, with focus on six work streams, delivery methods, fleet optimization, green buildings, waste management, eco-consumerism, and digital learning. Achieving this goal won't be easy, but by transitioning all our last mile vehicles to electric by 2030, and equipping over 400 of our facilities with solar PV technology, we are confident in our path towards fulfilling our ambitions. While we strive to ensure the growth of our business, we are committed to ensuring that this growth is managed in an impactful and fully sustainable way. To attain our sustainability objectives and uphold our promises, we are guided by three core categories, post green, post forward, and post care. With each parcel delivered and every letter sent, Post Malaysia plays a vital role in connecting people and businesses throughout the country. We take pride in having Malaysia's largest electric fleet and remain dedicated to the goal of achieving 100% electrification of our last mile vehicles by 2030. Our commitment to sustainability goes beyond our road fleet. We are also in the process of transforming our premises. This transformation includes generating clean energy, and implementing good waste management practices for our employees. We are also incorporating circular economy principles into our material procurement processes, while we actively collaborate with partners to contribute to the nation's transition towards green mobility infrastructure. We believe every small action, when replicated across our network, can lead to a significant change. We strive to foster an equitable and inclusive work environment by strengthening internal processes and enhancing digital learning platforms to empower and inspire our employees. It's not just about delivering mail and parcels, it's about delivering a brighter, sustainable future for Malaysians. In today's world, businesses have the power to make a difference beyond profits. They have the power to create a positive impact. That's why we have established Post Care, our corporate social responsibility arm to create a meaningful, and sustainable impact for the local communities around us, leveraging on our logistics expertise. Post Malaysia is not merely traversing the length and breadth of the nation, but also pioneering a journey towards a greener, cleaner, and a more prosperous tomorrow. Thank you. So that's end of my presentation heather there is some 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 questions that i can answer all right thank you so much jared for sharing that with all of us yes. um i can see we already have some some questions coming into the chat um and then i would invite any other participants if they want to raise their hands or uh mm -hmm. enter a question in the chat so that we can uh address those uh so we have a question here from granada post they would like to know, um, first of all, they enjoyed the presentation very much, and they'd like to know if the government offered any concessions to Malaysia Post uh, because you're helping the government with its nationally determined contributions, the NDCs. Wow, okay. Um, whether the government offered any concessions to us, the answer is no. <laughs> they did not. Uh, but of course, uh, we are engaging with them very closely in this. I think... For for here in Malaysia, it's like everyone is waiting to take the first step. Yeah, it's like looking at who who's who's going to blink first and then who's going to like take the first step and go for electric vehicles because it's such a new new technology and no one is 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 um is willing to take that first step and I think um one good thing is that we have a very dynamic CEO and he's very visionary and that's he's he's like let's just do it and then um on our part we need to find ways to and find the best way uh which uh not just operationally but also financially financially beneficial to us. I think um ultimately sustainability plays a plays a 
big part, but also we need to make sure that what we're doing is financially viable. We need to make sure that um, what we're doing is, is will not uh, bring, we'll, we'll bring financial benefit to the operation or the, to the company, which is where the cost savings, operational cost savings plays a big part into it. Yeah. Great, thank you. In Costa Rica, post uh, three or four, four years, we have had 15 electric, 15% 15 electric motorcycles with good performance. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, 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 I think earlier for, for us in Malaysia as well, we have just embarked this uh, uh, for the past, I would say, less than a year. Yeah, initially, there's a lot of postmen or uh, don't really like it. But now, I mean, Starting start, uh, because we on ourselves on our end we have a uh, fleet management system that where the postmans would able to key in their feedbacks every day, you know. So uh initially when we first threw out the bikes right the electric bikes right there were so many so many remarks, you know. But now it's like going down everything is back to normal you know yeah. Um but but of course it's um the supply of repair spare parts uh. It's 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 part of one of the um, one of our challenges as well. But I would say so far, uh, we don't have that major challenge that that would disrupt our operations. That's the that's the last thing that we want it to happen. Yeah. Okay, Heather. I think we have another question from Botswana. Yeah. Uh, okay. Are your targets for in emission reduction regarding scope one, scope two aligned to national standards? Does the national stand national nation has a goals targets per industry? They do not have a goals targets per industry, but our scope one and scope two, uh, yes, it's aligned to our national standards, and even our net uh net zero commitment is aligned to our country's uh net zero target as well. So what we're doing is that is that we want to. We want to uh first is definitely making sure that um what we're doing sustainability or or even business is aligned to the countries our countries or even the the uh, internationally standards. And secondly, is that we want to um as what my CEO mentioned, we really want to be the lighthouse example for others to follow as well. I think I think that's that's what inspired us to be better every day yeah all right thank you so much jared uh thank you for sharing the the presentation and i can see it was really appreciated by all of the the participants um we will be sharing the the recording of the presentations uh online so if you'd like to share uh the the feedback from the webinar with any of your colleagues uh, we will let you know in due course where to find that. Thank you. All right. So there's this one. Uh, which one? Oh, uh, one, last the last one then. What are the most in, in, most difficult to implement green tax? I think uh, first thing is is understanding whether th that technology is able to work for your business setting or not. And then subsequently, um, it's about making it a business case where it's not just about sustainability it's about uh, uh, making sure that the business can sustain itself so I always mention it to um, any of my uh, friends or colleagues it's, it's definitely three P's not just the planet not just the people but the profit as well all right thank you thanks Heather all right thank you to Jared for joining us all right, um, that was a, a really interesting presentation, but we have several more to come. Uh, I'd like to next welcome Mr. Titus Wojtara from ACSL. Uh, he will be sharing with us about uh, their drone delivery project that they, they worked with together with Japan Post. And we'd uh, like to hear uh, a bit about how they've used drones within the last mile and uh, what are what are some of the the, the challenges they've encountered along the way and how they've overcome those. Uh, so Titus, if you would like to uh, go ahead and take the floor, uh, we look forward to hearing from you. 
Yes, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, Jarrod, it, it was a very uh, interesting presentation. And my presentation will be uh, similar in the way that it will be about the electrification or the decarbonization of the delivery. Uh, I, I would like to share my slides, but uh, the system tells me that I'm not allowed because somebody else is sharing. So we will we will stop sharing and and let you have uh, okay. control of the screen. Right. Okay, I hope you can see the slides and hear me. Yes, I can. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, it's my pleasure to uh, give you an introduction about uh, ACSL and Japan Post drone delivery project. My name is Titus Boitara. I'm a director here at the ACSL uh, company. Uh, first, I would like to give you a short uh, introduction about the company itself. Sorry, jumped one. Okay, so uh, the company's name is uh, ACSL, and it, it is it was established uh, roughly ten years ago, and we are ba based in Tokyo, Japan, and uh, the number of employees is roughly seventy eight persons. So it's not a very big company in comparison to uh, our uh, Malaysia Post. And uh, what we are doing is we are uh, manufacturing and selling commercial drones. That's basically what we are doing. And the company itself is uh, very engineering oriented. We have 58% uh, of the employees are engineers. And also the company is quite international. We have uh, 20 uh, employees from abroad, including me. And a uh, we have already acquired a certification ISO 9001 for quality management, ISO 27001 for information security, and our clients are exclusive, exclusively companies, and we have uh, 213 of uh, uh, the number of them is 213. So now the next thing I would like to uh, talk about is the problem statement, because depending on which country you are from, this statement will be different. In uh, case of Japan, uh, sorry, I jumped again. Uh, in case of Japan, the problem statement is as follows. It is the, the imbalance of labor and dem demand and supply. And in on the left side, uh, I wrote what is about What's the problem with the demand on the right side? What is the problem with the supply? So the demand uh, comes from uh, the infrastructure. The, in many developed countries, the infrastructure is aging and Japan is one of them. So there is an estimate that uh, from 2018 to 2033, the infrastructure over 50 years old will be uh, 2.5 more than at the beginning of this period. Uh, also the logistics flow uh, is uh, has actually increased five folds in the last 30 years. And about the uh, labor supply, the labor force, uh, the population of Japan is de decreasing quite fast and it's uh, expected to decrease 26% uh, in the uh, next uh, 40 years. At the same time, the labor force is actually shrinking even faster than the population. This is because the uh, people in the productive age are getting less. And also not everybody is uh, willing to work in certain uh, parts of the industry. So in other countries, you might have uh, different uh, problem statements, like for example, congest congested roads or uh, not if sufficient roads or uh, bad roads or roads that are not possible during certain uh, in periods during the year, for example, rainy season or so on. So from the problem statement, uh, we go to the next one, to our direction that we would like to work 
towards, and this is the to eliminate the severe labor shortage to realize a free, open, and sustainable world. We want to ac accomplish this with the uh, help of drones. And what can drones do here? So dr drones can help here in the way that they can free people from the physical constraints. Drones can act automatically, and they, in in the in the sense, they can. Uh, there is no need for the human to intervene. Uh, drones can uh, act as human eye or human hand with their sensors and their actuators. And drones can move free, freely in space, indoor and outdoor. And then there is no need for the human to move around. And also drones can be remotely controlled. By, by remotely, I mean uh, over long distances, like from one big city to another big city. So this constraint of uh, time and space uh, becomes less for the human. So the next thing is to, to be able to accomplish this, this goal. Uh, we have entered into a capital and business partnership as this uh, triangle on the left uh, side shows. This is a, a capital and business partnership with the Japan Post and uh, Jap Japan uh, Post Capital. So we had this powerful uh, partners and we were able to start uh, to work towards this goal. On the right side, you can see the, as this is a scene from the press conference. So let me give you a little bit more information about this partnership. Uh, we actually already worked before this partnership was signed. We already worked with uh, Japan Post since 2017. And in this time, we had several projects together. So the first project was a, was a drone port project. And as you can see in the picture here, and the second one was 2018. It was a, a delivery between uh, one post office to, to another post office, and it was the so-called level three flight. Level three in Japan means that this is beyond visual line of sight flight, uh, but it is over sparsely populated areas. Then in 2019 and 20, respectively, we had delivery projects uh, of certain packages in remote areas. And then uh, after signing the partnership in 2021, we focused on promotion and practical applications, technology development and certifications. So within this uh, work, uh, we were able to establish the formation of a department specializing in postal logistics and promotion of the practical application of drones delivery from for Japan Post. Also, we uh, focused on the development of drones, operating environments and systems that enable efficient postal and logistics operations and the supply of these to Japan Post. And finally, uh, we were working on building of a cooperative system for acquiring various drone certifications. Then one of the first projects we had after uh, entering the partnership was this project here. Uh, this is a project that comprises not only a drone, but also a ground vehicle, UGV. And this project uh, was uh, realized uh, in Western Tokyo. I will uh, show this uh, video after that uh, in a place called Okutama. And uh, we were able to uh, prove this kind of concept uh, and uh, let me show you the video here. Okay, I hope it plays well. So this is a map of Tokyo. Tokyo is very long, uh, west east. In the eastern, in the western side, and there is a actually very rural, mountainous area. And you can see on the right upper side, a truck is is um, driving on the road. The road is very narrow, and the drone can be very useful in this mountainous area. The control center is in Tokyo, far away. I mean, in the, the actual urban Tokyo, because this part of Tokyo is really like countryside. And you can see the drone uh, flying here. Everything is monitored from Tokyo. 
And then the drone uh, flies from the post office towards the target, which is a, a house, a remote a house. And it approaches the drone port, drops the package, and the package uh, falls directly on the UGV, and the UGV is continuing the delivery. And everything is controlled from Tokyo, even uh, during this, this part of delivery. Can be monitored. Now the, the drone, uh, the, the vehicle approaches the driveway, drops off the package, and uh, the person can collect it. And the UGV is going back to the base, waiting for the next uh, delivery. Yeah, so these are, a, again, a short flash back of the, this project from different uh, from different angles. Okay, so the, the next thing that happened, the next project was the level four flight. And this is a very important thing, a level four. I was talking before, before about level three. This is level four which means uh, flight beyond visual line of sight over populated areas. Before it was over sparsely populated areas and now it's above populated areas. Uh, so this was uh, done, this, was, uh, this project was uh, carried out this year in March and we were able to uh, certify our drone, which is also big news for us and actually a big news for Japan. Uh, because we have received uh, the certification, type one certification for our drone PF2 CAT3 that can be seen in the picture on the uh, lower left corner. And uh, this certification was from Ministry of Land, Infrastructure, Transport and Tourism. And it was the first uh, certification of this kind in Japan. And this drone was later uh, provided to uh, Japan Post uh, for the delivery project. And in, within this project, it successfully transported in the one kilogram package in approximately nine minutes over a total flight distance of uh, 4.5 kilometers. Then uh, let me show you a little bit more about the uh, this project in comparison to other possibilities. So on the left side, you can see the uh, map of Tokyo as you showed, as I showed uh, shortly in the video. So Tokyo, uh, the urban area is close to the sea on the right right side, but uh, on the left side is an area administered by Tokyo, but it's very rural and uh, mountainous area, uh, we, and which is not not very uh, densely populated. Uh, and on the right side, you can see uh, three different paths. Uh, so from from the post office on the left side to a remote uh, house on the right side. So there are three different paths. The one, the lowest one is uh, the dotted, dotted one, is the actual uh, truck delivery route, which is a very narrow uh, winding road in the mountains. And it's very narrow so that if two vehicles pass each other, they have actually to, to almost stop or uh, one of them has to back, back, uh, back off to, to let the other pass. And then we had two different projects there. There is the level three and level four. Uh, so here you can see uh, the red one is the level three. Uh, we had to avoid populated areas. That's why this path is longer, six, six kilometers. And level four is the one that uh, can freely fly over populated area. That's why it is the, the shortest possible path. So you might think, okay, why is it not, why isn't it a straight line? So uh, because of the mountains, you can avoid mountains either by going up or down or by going uh, sideways. So we uh, chose to fly around the mountains and we have a limit of uh, altitude, which is 150 meters above ground. So we have to keep, uh, we kept, we have to keep this limit. Uh, this, this limit is prescribed by, by law. Okay, so within this project, we uh, the, the drone delivery entered its practical stage. 
we had now the drone and we have also the regulations, level four regulations and the drone that was certified. And here our achievements was were the improved potential, operational efficiency and improved acceptance. Uh, the project showed that delivery to remote areas can be more efficient with drones and uh, also the level four flight expands the allowable area. Uh, level four flights make it also easier to route flights in comparison to level three because we can go uh, directly. And also uh, what happened during this, this time is that safety improved a lot because of the uh, certification system that the government uh, put in place for drones and pilots. And talking about safety, uh, let me show you, uh, there were uh, two aspects that I would like to show about the drone itself, uh, redundancy and fault tolerance. So about uh, redundancy, our drone, uh, which was certified, has a cer certain redundancy implemented. Uh, one of them is the GPS antennas. You can see in the picture, uh, circled in red, we have two different uh, GPS antennas. So if one of them uh, falls out or um, has a bad reception, the other one take, can take over. Also, other critical components like uh, the IMU, the inertial measurement unit, uh, so the gyro and the accelerometer, magnetic compass and so on, all of them are uh, redundant. I mean, they, they, are, more of, more, they are more than one of them. That's why uh, the system is redundant. And on the right side, uh, it's about fault tolerance. Uh, there are there are two things to mention. One thing is uh, a drone has six motors, but if one of them stops for whatever reason, uh, the drone can reconfigure itself to a quad rotor, which means only four rod motors will work, and the drone can still fly and uh, safely land, and it will fly to the next emergency emergency landing spot. And the other thing is. Uh, a parachute. So if the drone uh, fails completely, the, the power is off for some reason, or the drone loses balance or starts falling, this will be detected and the parachute opens. And so the drone uh, loses a lot of, uh, uh, will have less en energy on impact, which means uh, the drone will survive and uh, whatever be is below the drone will also not be damaged. And I would like to show uh, short videos to both of these topics, redundancy and fault tolerance. So this pic this video, uh, you have to be very uh, careful to watch because it's not easy to see. Uh, this drone has six rotors. One of them will stop during flight. I don't know if you can hear the sound of the rotors, but if you can, then you will see, uh, you, you will hear a slight difference in the pitch uh, because uh, two propellers will uh, I mean, one will stop, the other will, one will be switched off as a consequence. And then the other four have to take over, which means higher uh, RPMs. So maybe there is no, no sound. Uh, anyway, so the drone flies and you, in, in a moment, one of the rotors will uh, stop. So it's, it's a, it will be a simulated failure. So around around here, uh, and the, you you won't see it immediately because the pro, the propeller is still rotating. But if you uh, wait now, you can now you can see the closest rotor here on the right is actually actually stopped. It doesn't rotate anymore, and the one on the other side either below the antennas. So we have only four uh, rotors now, and the drone still flies without any problem. Okay, the next. Uh, video is about uh, parachute deployment. So we have the drone flying and then it will uh, start falling. So we simulate a, f a power outage and then automatically the parachute opens uh, with pyrotechnics and the drone uh, glides to the ground. Okay, so uh, finally I would like to give a, a a summary uh, of the Japan Post and ACSL joint initiative. Uh, so everything started in 2016 uh, with technical investigation, validation, and demonstrations. 
uh, with the first project being the drone port demonstration. Then in 2018, we had a flight between two different of, uh, post office, uh, uh, between two, two offices. And this was the Japan's uh, first level three, level three del delivery. Then uh, we had uh, in the period of 2019 to 22, have the, the first uh, last mile level three delivery. And uh, we had delivery to individual homes, then also the capital and business alliance with Japan Post was signed and we had the UGV collaboration project. And uh, we also had the uh, flight demonstration with the drone port. And uh, finally this year we had the development of dedicated logistics drone uh, level or certification and flight. And we are working on also uh, next models of dedicated logistics drones. So that's all for my presentation. Thank you very much for your time. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. All right, thank you so much, Titus, for sharing that with us. Uh, I can see we already have um, some some interest popping up in the chat and we have some questions. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question here from Costa Rica uh, and they'd like to know what the, the process was like uh, for convincing uh, that the delivery by drones could be efficient. Okay, so I understand the, what was the process to convince uh, the, the government or is, is it about the certification or uh, I'm not completely sure um, about the intent of this question. Uh, so uh, maybe Costa Rica this, yeah. we can can clarify, yeah. but perhaps uh, within the post or if there were if there was work also with the government. Um, yeah, I, I assume this is for the certification because uh, to be able to uh, to get the certification, you have to fulfill uh, many conditions. So there was this kind of, uh, as I explained, the, the redundancy and the uh, fault tolerance. This is more about safety, but about uh, efficiency. About efficiency. So uh, if, if we speak about the efficiency, we, we didn't have to actually to convince anybody about the, the efficiency in this way, but uh, the thinking here is that Efficiency in comparison to trucks, uh, let's say in, in, in Tokyo area, in the urban area, it is still more efficient to deliver with trucks. Uh, there is only certain places where delivery with drone could be more efficient. This is, uh, for example, in these remote areas. Uh, this is in the mountains or uh, in some islands because Japan has many islands as well. So in this uh, areas, uh, it's clear that it can ha has some benefit. And also this is only for packages that are up to certain uh, weight, so small packages. Uh, but uh, we are estimating that as I, as I showed you, the, the motivation for this was the, the shrinking workforce and the number of packages increasing. So if this trend continues like this, and also the technology is being developed, so we estimate that in about 10 years, it will be clearly more efficient to use drones in many more areas than it is now. I hope this, uh, this answer is satisfying. All right, we have a few more questions coming in. Me I too. think the, the next one uh, ties in a bit to that because they want to know, uh, if this could be considered a, a global solution uh, for for the delivery of parcels, uh, knowing that today the the drones are transporting one one parcel at a time, um, would this be you know considered to be something that's growing, or on the other mm -hmm. hand, is it more to to implement perhaps for a specific uh, urgent shipment, uh, or for something that's that's very important? In which in which way could that be envisioned? Yeah, I think the, the 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 question has already the answer in it. So yes, uh, uh, I I don't think that uh, drones will replace trucks. 
uh, trucks will be the, uh, will are here to stay. We have uh, autonomous driving coming, uh, electrical vehicles. So trucks will be useful and efficient in urban areas, places where you have many packages and you have to deliver them. But there is some areas that drones can supplement uh, this uh, the, the trucks. So it they will more closely work together. Maybe trucks will be equipped with with drones as well that will deliver the the last uh, few hundred meters of uh, last mile uh, to to the customer. Uh, so it depends wh where it is. As, as said, urgent uh, deliveries, uh, mountainous areas. Uh, let's say you have traffic jams and you need to deliver something. Uh, you have remote areas. You have uh, islands. Uh, yeah, so all these special cases uh, will be dealt uh, with drones. Uh, it was it will be more more uh, sim seamlessly uh, integrated with trucks that deliver. Uh, this is the vision that I have, and most people around me share a similar vision. Okay, I think we have a couple of other questions as well. One relates to: uh, Do you know what level or to what extent that uh, drones are being used for delivery in Japan? And then the second question is, do you have any considerations related to crime? Uh, I suppose theft of packages or the drones. Yeah, yeah so the uh, drones in Japan, um, uh, how, to what extent they are used? So uh, the level four, so level four flights, which means flying over populated areas, this, uh, the legislation only changed last year at the end of last year. So there is not many drones that have this certification. They, not many drones can actually fly over populated areas. So one, one uh, our drone was the first. I, I know that other drones are now, the other companies are trying, but there is not much, uh, it's not really very, uh, it's, not, it's not part of the delivery, uh, standard delivery right now. This is more like a proof of concepts and uh, some projects here and there. And the second question was, sorry, once again. That's okay. Uh, it's related to crime surrounding uh, the crime, use of yes. drones or the packages. Yeah. yeah, so the the crime in Japan is super low in comparison to many other countries. So we don't really worry about it right now, but yes, I, sooner or later, I think this will, be, this will be a problem. So as you saw the UGV driving around like that, uh, this probably can work in some areas, but in probably not in the cities. Yeah, that's my answer. Great. Thank you very much for a very informative presentation. Heather? All right. Thank you. Um, well, thank you to, to Titus for sharing all of that with us. Uh, I think drones and autonomous vehicles is an area that of, of great interest for our members and that we've we've received a lot of questions and inquiries about. Um, so I know that they they appreciate as well what you shared with us today. Thank uh, you very much. All right, if we if we'll switch back now to our main presentation. Uh, I think that we are we are ready to to continue with our our next speaker. Uh, joining us from USPS is uh, Mr. Fernando Mello. Uh, he will be sharing with us today about uh, USPS's project on informed delivery. Uh, this is a really interesting uh, project that they've been running, which uh, brings benefits for both their, their customers and also their, their business clients. And so I think we will have some, some interesting things to learn from him. So Fernando, uh, I'll, I'll hand the floor over to you. Uh, thank you, Heather and the UPU team. Uh, so my name is Fernando Mello. I work for the United States Postal Service in Washington, D.C. I'm really excited to be here to talk to you all about informed delivery. Uh, next slide, please. All right. So informed delivery was created out of a need to innovate. Uh, the Postal Service was looking at strategies to combat the um, reduction of mail volume and the diversion to other uh, digital marketing channels. And in doing research, what we found is that nothing really can replace uh, the value of hard copy. And the mail is just not going away, but we needed to find um, some strategies 
to better integrate uh, physical and digital to meet consumers where they are now in our really digital world. Next slide, please. So the history of informed delivery actually starts about 10 years ago um, as a small test uh, in local markets. In 2015, we launched informed delivery in the Washington DC area, and we expanded to New York City shortly afterwards in 2016. And our national rollout for informed delivery happened in 2017. And since then, we've uh, done our part to help enhance the value of mail to keep mail relevant in today's digital environment. Uh, next slide, please. So this is how informed delivery does keep mail relevant. It's bridging the gap between physical and digital. So we provide our eligible residential, now business and PO box users, digital previews of their mail and packages expected to arrive soon. The way we do this is uh, primarily on the left here, you see, uh, we provide images that we pull from our mail processing equipment to the recipients. We provide these notifications uh, via email through an online portal on USPS.com and through the USPS mobile app. What we offer businesses is the ability to run interactive campaigns. And these interactive campaigns include a color image that replaces that black and white image that we pull from our mail processing equipment. And it includes a smaller image shown just below where uh, the user can take advantage of an offer. They're able to click on that image and they are sent to a digital experience. This could be the, uh, the merchant's you know, main website uh, or even a particular page designed for uh, their informed delivery customers. And all of this uh, marketing content must relate to the mail piece that they're receiving. So there's a clear um, connection between what our customers are seeing on informed delivery and what they're receiving in their mailbox. Uh, next slide, please. This is how informed delivery works. Everything is based off the mail piece. So informed delivery really functions off uh, the normal processing that we have already done for several years. Um, uh, click please. So we've imaged mail for quite a while um, and we've never used those mail piece images for anything externally. And so what we're doing with informed delivery is we're collecting those images that we um, take during processing. We scanned the, the barcodes on those mail pieces and we use pieces of that barcode to match uh, the mail piece to an informed delivery household. The recipient, if they're enrolled for informed delivery, they'll get the informed delivery notification. And then that final uh, touch point is still there. So there's the digital touch point through informed delivery, and there's still that physical touch point when that customer receives that mail piece in their mailbox. And in fiscal year 2023, this is October 2022 through September of this year, informed delivery displayed an average of two and a half billion total mail pieces uh, across all of our registered users. Uh, next slide, please. Our user base is continuing to grow at um, close to, to three quarters of a million of users per month. And in fiscal year 2023, we acquired 8 million new users. Where we currently stand as of November 1st is that we have 59.4 million registered accounts. Uh, that's a growth of 14% from the previous year. 50.8 million of those users are enrolled in the email. And that's a growth of 15.5% from the previous year. And there are 42.5 million total households across the United States that have at least one informed delivery user. So we do, uh, we measure our household saturation and that's a, a measure of the percentage of eligible households that have at least one informed delivery user. And you can see that on the map there, our national saturation is around 31%. So close to one third of all eligible addresses, whether those are residential homes, uh, PO boxes, or even some business addresses have at least one informed delivery user. And next slide, please. 
And email does lead the way as the preferred channel for customers to view and interact with their um, notificate with their um, mail content. We do a quarterly survey, and as part of that survey, we ask which channels our users use regularly, and they can use more than one channel. So that's why the totals here add up to more than a hundred percent. But ninety-two percent of our customers say they use the email regularly. Uh, the next closest channel is our online portal on USPS.com at a 19%. So all of our users rely on the email digest to receive their content, but they'll also go online to take action on their packages, for example, where we have most of our package features are on the online portal on USPS.com. In fiscal year 2023, uh, sorry, previous slide, we actually sent out more than 10 billion emails to our customers. And the really encouraging number is that those 10 billion emails were opened at a 64% average email open rate. And that is upwards of three times higher than industry average for email marketing. Uh, next slide. In that same customer survey that we run quarterly, we gauge our, our customer uh, interest in the future and we collect feedback. And overall, it's been really positive what we hear from our users. 94% say that they would recommend the future, and many of them do. 91% uh, are satisfied or very satisfied with the informed delivery service. And 88% say they use informed delivery as part of their daily routine. Um, I know that um, through our, our survey, we get a lot of, res of, of open-ended responses. And what we hear is that customers build this into their morning routine. They wake up, they check their informed delivery email. That comes in usually between 7 uh, to 9 a.m. Uh, local time. And um, it's just something that they do every day. And for packages, 65% of our users say they use informed delivery as part of their daily routine to track their packages. And over half of our users use informed delivery when they're out of town. It's one of the key benefits of informed delivery is you're able to see the mail that's coming to your home when you're traveling. Uh, next slide, please. I wanna shift gears now to focus on how informed delivery is offering businesses the ability to, to run these omni-channel campaigns where they're able to increase their reach with their mail and increase the engagement uh, with their customers. Next slide, please. I mentioned uh, the interactive campaigns feature, and this is how businesses can um, engage their customers digitally um, with, with mail. In order to do this, uh, businesses have to provide some additional information to the Postal Service in order for us to um, match not only the mail piece to the customer, but also the interactive campaign. The, the pieces of information that are needed include the images themselves, the URL, the dates, and some additional details on the intelligent mail barcode that's going to be printed on the physical mail pieces. We process and image the mail as normal. So there's no real difference in how we, we work the mail uh, that's part of these campaigns. But when we match the mail piece to a customer, and to an active campaign, that's when we'll replace the images from our mail processing equipment with the marketing images that are provided by the business. And the recipient is able to see those uh, images and that marketing content on informed delivery even before they receive their physical mail piece. So they're able to engage with that brand um, even before that piece gets to their home. And as part of doing interactive campaigns, Businesses get analytics, including the number of impressions that they generated on informed delivery. Impressions are the instances where uh, their campaign is displayed. Uh, it, we also provide the number of emails and email opens and the total clicks to their offer um, for the duration of their campaigns. Uh, next slide, please. We've extended the interactive campaign features to packages. I know the focus of informed delivery has really always been and started out being for uh, mail, but we've continued to expand what we offer for packages. So in that same Daily Digest email, um, if you scroll down beyond the mail section, we have a section for packages. 
In the packages section, we display packages expected to arrive that day. We include packages that are expected to arrive in two days or less. And we include a section for any outbound packages. So when a customer creates labels through uh, the Postal Service um, application called Click and Ship, we pull that information in so our informed delivery customers can see where their outbound packages are um, as they progress down their journey. So what we offer now for businesses is the ability to add um, some marketing content to their packages that are displayed on informed delivery. So similar to what we offer mail, our shippers need to provide some additional information for us to be able to uh, conduct these campaigns. Uh, essentially, they, they provide the similar marketing content like the image. In this case, it's just one image, right? It's just that clickable marketing image shown there on the right. And when an informed delivery customer is using informed delivery to view their incoming packages, should that package have an active campaign associated with it, we'll display that marketing offer. So our informed delivery customers can not only track their packages, but they're able to take advantage of offers provided by that shipper um, from informed delivery. So this kind of provides um, some benefits, obviously, to the brand itself in terms of potentially generating additional sales, um, getting customers to understand um, about their brand or product. But from a customer perspective, it also gives them the ability to get more information and also take advantage of offers and follow up purchases that relate to their um, initial order. Next slide, please. There are several options for uh, businesses to submit their content for informed delivery. And uh, one of the challenges that we faced is, is how to make informed delivery accessible to businesses of every type. We want informed delivery to be an accessible way for small businesses to do digital marketing. But we also want informed delivery to work at scale for large businesses. And that's why we created um, several options. The first and most widely used option is our set of uh, online portals. We have a mailer campaign portal and a shipper campaign portal. And these are really suited for businesses of any size. The submission of campaigns to these channels is, is manual and it re requires no programming. And these portals not only serve as, as locations for submitting campaigns, but this is the primary location where businesses can see all of their campaign activity that they submit through the other channels as well. And this is where we provide the data for campaigns. So it is our most widely used channel. About three quarters of campaigns are submitted through those portals. The next option is really suited for commercial mailers who are not only um, interested in doing informed delivery, but they're also responsible for submitting other electronic documentation to the postal service, including things like postage payment. Um, that's all done through our Postal One application. So large businesses who are doing so have the ability to also provide informed delivery content through the Postal One application. This does require programming, and that's why it's really better suited for our larger commercial mailers. And the last option uh, is through our application programming interface uh, suite of tools. And while it's, it's currently mostly used by larger businesses, it's something that can be used by businesses of any size. Uh, APIs provide the ability for our automation, and it can help businesses build the informed delivery process within their existing business flow. So for example, some businesses are offering mail services for small businesses, where small businesses can create mail pieces, provide the, the, the audience, and these businesses are creating the mail pieces and actually sending it out for them. Our APIs can be built into that process. So when a, a business is offering these services to other clients, they're able to ask if they want to uh, participate in informed delivery. If they do, they're able to provide those contents via API, and it makes the process run smoothly. In fiscal year 2023, we saw more than 221,000 total campaigns run through all of these channels. Uh, next slide, please. I want to show a couple of examples of how informed delivery is proving to be a success across the industry. And the first is for mail. The Martha Stewart brand in 2022 used informed delivery as its own advertising medium. They created content specifically for informed delivery. It was a shoppable catalog that was accessed to, through informed delivery. And as they mailed those physical catalogs, 
they included a link to their digital catalog, which was distributed through informed delivery. And this was a huge success to the Martha brand. Next slide, please. And on the packages side, State Farm the, is an insurance company here in the United States, and uh, they're a huge partner with us uh, for informed delivery for packages. And their um, goal was to increase activations for one of their products that they ship to their customers. These are these devices that customers install in their vehicles. And through informed delivery, they distributed a way for customers to get uh, a video to learn how to install the product because they uh, noticed that a lot of people would ask for the product, but wouldn't actually follow through with the installation. With uh, doing informed delivery campaigns, they saw the activation rate for their uh, product increase by 8%. And to them, this was a huge success. Next slide, please. All right, so I'm gonna close out by focusing on some features that we've launched to help the uh, experience for our customers as they um, are waiting on their mail and packages to arrive. Next slide. So a couple of consumer features here. The first is mail piece reminders. So in doing research and talking with customers, we, we found that while informed delivery fits well with their, their daily routine, they don't always wanna take advantage of the offer they're provided on informed delivery right then and there. So we built a uh, reminders feature where our customers, as they look at their informed delivery content on the email, if they wanna set a reminder on a mail piece, let's say they're getting a bill uh, and they wanna set a reminder that they need to pay that bill next week, they're able to hit a, the set reminder button. They can choose a date in the future and on that day, they'll get an additional email from informed delivery with that mail piece image again. If that mail piece has an interactive campaign, we'll display that campaign again in that additional email so that the recipient can take advantage of that offer at a time that makes sense for them. And another feature is our sharing feature. Customers are able to share the content they receive for interactive campaigns. Um, should the brand uh, allow it. So when submitting an informed delivery interactive campaign, businesses can choose to have their content be shareable or not. If their content is shareable, uh, the customer receiving the informed delivery campaign will be able to click on uh, an, a button to share that offer via email, text, through Facebook or Twitter. And what they're sharing is the link, just that link. So if I'm getting an offer from a business that I think a family or friend may be interested in, I can click on the share button. And if I choose text, it'll open up my text messaging app and it'll have a pre-written text message with that um, link that was provided through informed delivery. And the second piece of this is we want, our, we want to encourage our users to share the informed delivery enrollment with other uh, people. So at the bottom of the informed delivery email, we have a referral banner and we're seeing um, more than 6,000 referrals per day through that banner. Uh, next slide, please. And we are currently working on a, an informed delivery uh, standalone mobile app. I mentioned that the email is currently the most widely used channel, but we believe that there are additional features that are possible through a mobile app, things like push notifications and more customization. And we've heard from research that consumers really do want a mobile experience. And so we are actively working on a mobile app that we hope to have um, by summertime 2024 here. Next slide, please. All right, and, and to close out on what we offer for packages, Informed delivery is a place where customers can also take action on the packages they're receiving. They can not only track uh, their packages, but they can also set a uh, re-delivery. So if their packages fail to be delivered for one reason or another, they're able to schedule a re-delivery back to their home or to our uh, USPS smart parcel lockers. They're also able to set delivery instructions uh, so that the carrier knows where to leave their packages. And uh, they're able to sign for signature required packages electronically. So if a customer is not going to be home, they're able to provide their electronic signature for a package and the carrier will leave that package there without requiring a signature. Uh, next slide, please. 
So we do have uh, information available online. Uh, our business mailers website includes a variety of guides and information uh, for the informed delivery interactive campaigns feature. We have um, a link uh, in the middle there, which includes most of our technical guides. And then the link on the far right includes information for consumers and consumer features. So I wanna really thank you all for your time and your attention today. Um, I'd like to open it up to questions. Hi, yeah, it, what a great presentation. Uh, it looks like we do have one question from the Hellenic Post, Elta in Greece. Does the informed delivery as it is now offer the customer an option for later delivery? in the cases where customers are out of delivery areas uh, during the holidays, et cetera? Yeah, so it's a great question. Um, so in phone delivery, currently we don't offer that feature exactly as described, but we do offer the ability to get to our hold mail service. So the postal service here offers what we call hold mail, and a customer is able to have their mail held at the post office for a set period of time. So through informed delivery, we are able to link our customers to that service. It is not an informed delivery service necessarily, but it's something that we can uh, link to uh, and offer that to our customers. For packages, uh, it's the same thing. If you're holding your mail, uh, we'll also hold your packages at the post office. For a package by package uh, instance, uh, I mentioned that um, informed delivery offers the ability to re-deliver your packages. So if you're not home um, for a particular delivery, you can use informed delivery to schedule that package to be re-delivered. Thank you very much for your presentation. All right, thank you so much to Fernando uh, for, the, for the presentation. I think that was a, a really interesting uh, offering to hear about and, and how you're kind of uh, leveraging the informed delivery uh, product to benefit both the customers uh, and the businesses that you're working with. So thank you very much for sharing that with us. Uh, we'd like finally now to turn to uh, Correios do Brasil. We're going to hear uh, from Mr. Guilherme de Souza Carvalho about their uh, parcel lock locker implementation in Brazil uh, and hear how they're using that uh, to uh, to benefit and to overcome some challenges that they, they find in the last mile delivery. So, Guilherme, I'll, I'll give you the floor now. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Heather. Good morning, everyone. It's morning here in Brazil. Let me first introduce myself. I work for the Brazilian post office and at Correios. And we... We are a pretty, we've been pretty a long company in Brazil, over 350 years uh, doing the postal service in Brazil. And, and before we start talking about lockers, uh, I can see the presentation, Heather. I don't know if you are going to present it. Uh, yes, we have that. Just a moment, please. Oh, okay, sure. While we pull it up. Uh, we would like first to context uh, how Brazil is right now. Uh, I mean, from its size, we may know it's a continental country and we have a lot of uh, challenges to, to reach every part of Brazil and every municipality. So could you go to the next slide, please? And here on the left side, we have the, the map of Brazil, uh, where the darkest areas, the darkest gray areas, it's where we have more of uh, our economic uh, operations. And on the lightest areas, the gray areas, uh, we have a less economically developing states. Uh, we have over 9.5 million locations, uh, districts we need, Correios needs to attend. And we have uh, over two, uh, 214 million inhabitants in Brazil. Uh, first of all, Correio is a public organization. Uh, we, are, we are very regulated by the government of Brazil. Uh, we have the Ministry of Communication 
uh, which uh, publicy laws and, and uh, rules about how Correios needs to work. And uh, the, our main challenge, uh, like a big con country, is to attend every single citizen of Brazil. And some areas we don't have that, that uh, financial return. So in the biggest areas like Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro, we need to compensate the, the financial terms for the areas that we don't, we don't have uh, many, many business running. Uh, on the right side, we have some numbers of Correios. Uh, we deliver daily over eight, uh, 11 million messages per day, uh, 2.3 parcels uh, uh, daily also, including national and international parcels. Uh, we have over 11,000 uh, uh, attending uh, units like for retail, and also for pickup and, and delivery with more than two, two, 241 million uh, people being attended a day. Uh, we have nine, uh, our fleet is about uh, nine uh, airlines that we uh, path that we do over Brazil every day with more than 300 tons of cargo. Uh, so, uh, in the municipalities, uh, Correios uh, is present in every one of them, over 5,500 municipalities uh, distributed over Brazil and over 9.5 districts, uh, including those municipalities. Uh, every day we run uh, over 1 million of, uh, and 7, 1 million 7,000 kilometers a day, including our uh, vans and, and big trucks, which uh, transport the cargo between the states. And uh, our workforce, we have over 48,000 postmen and over 18,000 uh, people that work at the uh, attendant units. Could we go next slide, please? Okay, so uh, specific on our last mile, uh, we, we call it uh, distribution here. We have uh, 40, over 43,000 uh, uh, mailmen every day on the streets, delivering messages and parcels to our population. We have over uh, 12,000 uh, delivery vans every day also on the streets, over 6,000 motorcycle and 5,000 bicycles. And now specifically talking about the lockers, uh, we we've started uh, installing the lockers in the in the late 2020s, in the first pandemic year, and right now we have over 14, uh, 140 lockers and over 560 CCIs, uh, which uh, we call uh, these specific uh, cabinets, smart lockers that private uh, home complex install uh, to, for receiving their packages where they don't have a uh, a human being to receive, they install these uh, CCIs, which is very similar to the lockers, but uh, they are private for that specific uh, complex, residential complex. Uh, next slide, please. So right now, uh, the numbers, uh, when we are talking about lockers, uh, we have three types of lockers, uh, mainly. Uh, the ones from uh, that Correios purchase uh, for for our own, and to and we install them uh, where we decide is the best spot. We have six three of them right now. Uh, we have uh, the second type of lockers are the rented ones with our partners. We have four partners and we are expanding to six partners in Brazil. Uh, we need to to make clear that uh, it's a pretty. Pretty brand new technology in Brazil, so the population is starting to get used to use the lockers, and we've been doing some researches with them. And they, uh, once they they uh, use it for the first time, they are very satisfied by the service that we are providing. And right now we have eighty lock, eighty rented lockers from our partners. And the CCIs, the smart lockers in private complex, we have uh, 582 at the moment. 
So uh, uh, the quantity of active lockers, uh, as I said, we started uh, implementing these lockers in the, the latest, in the late 2020, uh, after the first pandemic year. And in the beginning, it was a challenge to, to purchase these equipments because we had uh, a lot of lack of uh, uh, suppliers in the market. Uh, we had difficult, they had difficult to find uh, pieces to, to build the lockers. So the, the project was delayed a little bit. We started, uh, we started studying about lockers in Correios uh, in 2013, approximately. And we've been installing these lockers uh, for over the last years. Uh, in the places that we find are more attractive for our population to use it. Uh, in the matter of the quantity of parcels, uh, we see a, a, a tendency of a growing line. And the, de the data here show us that in the beginning, uh, we had trouble uh, making publicity of this equipment for the population to get used to and how they should work. Uh, we we kind of have a, a challenge with our clients to to make available the the this uh, type of uh, delivery uh, for the population for their uh, for their buyers so uh, but once they 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 started using they they, they realized it was a, a good option especially for those people who doesn't have door to door delivery and on the same way the quantity of smart lockers has been increasing over the last 2 years and we are expecting to expand this, uh, this network uh, pretty soon. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, so uh, our challenges here to, 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 to the, the, this channel we call lockers. It's a new technology in Brazil, right? So uh, people need to get used to it. Uh, people uh, need to, to know that they exist uh, because uh, we're not making, we don't have this uh, support of making this much uh, publicity of the, the this channel, but we are working on it, especially with our uh, customers from Correios, our uh, the sellers, and uh, it uh, it's very important that uh, we say that the customers uh, really enjoy using it, even though it's a new technology. It has been uh, we have very good. Uh, feedback from from the populations and, and and these customers once they use the the this channel of receiving their packages they stay loyal to it because they usually uh, uh, the main uh, target of this channel is it's the population that either lives in a in a in an area that doesn't have uh, delivery, uh, door to door delivery, for ex example, the the rural, the rural area, or also the the places where the uh, we they have violence, the crime the crime rate is too high, and Correios stops uh, attending and delivering uh, parcels on the on that location. So uh, the main the main, the specific point of uh, implementing lockers is uh, attending these populations. Uh, and also, uh, we we understand that these lockers need to need to be on the on the route of these people from home to work, in order to to make it very simple for them to to pass through one of these in uh, to receive the, the, their parcels. So, uh, which are our target audience, uh, people who don't have access to home delivery, and. Another challenge that we have implementing our own lockers is their maintenance of the, the equipment. Uh, 24, 24 hours by seven days a week. Uh, since we, we don't have a, a specific team uh, taking care of the maintenance of, the, of this equipment, uh, we, we usually choose, uh, we, we have been expanding our network, locker network, uh through partnerships those four and the next and including this year we'll be uh, expanding it to six uh, partners and some evolution some developments that this uh channel is bringing to Correios. Uh, right now we we are only uh, delivering parcels to to the population we but we are starting to 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 study uh, other services to 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 be so people can use the locker for other service. 
Uh, we have like uh, uh, reverse logistics, uh, which uh, is when uh, a person buys some parcel and, and is not happy or satisfied with the item, he, he will return it to our, uh, to, our, to the seller. Uh, we will be implementing this in the next year. Uh, and opening the terminal from, uh, for delivery from other companies. Right now, our lockers are exclusive for Coheis. We don't, uh, we don't share the locker with, uh, with other companies and, and charge them for it. Right now, it's for only our, our use. Uh, next slide, please. And another channel that uh, we, we think is uh, complemented to the lockers it's our poodles, uh, the pickup and drop off points, right? Uh, right now, uh, it's another uh, type of delivery that Correios has been implementing uh, really, uh, pretty soon. Uh, we have uh, 32 points already in Brazil. We have 16 in the state of Sao Paulo, nine in Minas Gerais, seven in the federal district, and one in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, and we are preparing to rapidly exp expand uh, the these pickup points. Uh, we are we have it's it's also a new channel that Correios has been implementing. Uh, we have our challenges to to adapt some system. We have a uh, uh, legacy systems that need to be uh, developed uh, to attend also this technology. Uh, but the difference from poodles to to lockers is that we have a. A person to attend our customers, so this person can uh, perform uh, a lot of roles in the poodle, like, uh, like be a postman, be an attendant, and be uh, to 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 change how they they, they deliver the address and everything uh, that happens in the point of delivery. So and also they have uh, these active participations. They they do their own merchandising, their marketing. And that helps a lot to develop the channel. While the locker, another challenge is that uh, the the Correios, the 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 center of Correios, need to do uh, all that by the other channels that uh, they are more expensive uh, from comparing to the to the participation of our partners when they do in a regional area. Um, Okay, the next slide, please. So, uh, what uh, one one point that we need to make uh, to be pretty clear about uh, the lockers, uh, how how do we decide uh, which one to use, when to use our when to purchase for ourselves, for ourselves, and when to use our partner's lockage locker. Uh, the main point is uh, the address where we're gonna install it. Uh, for our own, uh, for our own lockers, the, the the ones that we purchase, uh, we we have sometimes we have trouble finding the a good spot uh, to to implement it, uh, and also we need to pay the fees and and the maintenance of the equipment. So uh, depending whether the occupation uh, the uh, the occupation of the locker will be or not, uh, we we've been deciding to. To change it to the lockers with our partners, since they 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 supply all these costs for the for the lockers, uh, the maintenance and the and uh, changing uh, uh, defeated uh, parts, and we have a more agile uh, support when we we implement lockers from from partners. Uh, another uh, important point is that. Uh, over 6% of the population of Brazil lives in poor communities. So these communities, uh, Correios, our postman can't enter because of the violence and crime rate. And we, we are using these channels to attend all this, uh, these addresses. Uh, and since it's a new technology, we want to, to, to introduce the, all this population to the e-commerce. Uh, since we know uh, they usually don't buy just because of the delivery and uh, uh, these channels are permitting uh, them to, to, to be integrated to the society. That's the, the, the main goal for Correios. Is, is, uh, one, of, one of the main goals is to be a social company and we are, we are trying to include all this, this population to the, to the market. 
Um, and I guess that's it for now, Heather. Uh, if you have any, uh, any, any questions, uh, we'll be happy to be answering. Hi, yeah, I do think we have a, um, a question. We have someone with their hand raised. Does Zara, I think she had a question about the presentation. So I'm gonna unmute you or ask you to unmute, does Zara? We'll see if she's ready to ask it. Okay. Okay. It does not look like she is um, able to unmute herself at this time. Um, so what I think uh, her question was basically, will the presentations, your really good presentation and the rest be Thank posted you. somewhere or provided to the participants? And so uh, we did respond to that. So just so you know, we will inform all participants by email when the recording and presentations are on the website. So thank you very much for raising that and everyone who asked that. And thank you very much for the informative presentation. Heather? Thank you. We, we appreciate the opportunity for being here. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Guilherme, for sharing that. Uh, I think it was really, really useful for our participants. Um, and yeah, we, we will be able to share more of those, more of those details online later. Uh, so this brings us now to the, to the end of our, of our webinar. I have just a few more points, uh, housekeeping points to go over with you. Uh, first of all, uh, if you could flip to the next slide, we have a, uh, a survey going on right now on the UPU's last mile delivery strategy. Um, we have in fact passed the, the deadline for the for this survey, but just as a, a last chance, if anyone would, would like to, to participate in this survey, you can find the link there. Um, or through the QR code, and we would be really eager to have your your input uh, and to hear from from all of the UPU members uh, about what kind of projects uh, and activities you'd be interested in relating to uh, the last mile delivery strategy for the UPU. Uh, additionally, if you could flip to the next slide. Uh, we are setting up a uh, working group uh, to work on the last mile delivery strategy and as well as uh, the, the projects that we identify uh, within that strategy. And so we'd be looking for participants. We're eager to hear from you if you'd like to join our working group uh, on this topic. Uh, we're just setting it up now, but the, this is something that we can really use input, whether you have a lot of experience or hardly any experience in this, in this area, uh, your input will, will help us to form the overall picture. So we would be really uh, eager to, to have you join our working group. And if you're uh, interested in doing so, you can uh, contact the transport program, transport at upu.int uh, to, to confirm your ability to join this, this group. And uh, that brings us to the, to the end of our webinar for today. Uh, we will again be emailing all of you, all of the participants that were here today. Uh, once we have the, the recording of the webinar and the presentations from the webinar available on the website, so you can look for that uh, in your email, as well as um, an evaluation for, to, of, the web, of today's webinar to help us prepare uh, for any future webinars that we organize. Uh, so you can all be looking for that in your in your inboxes. Uh, and I'd like to, to thank all of our speakers for sharing today for, uh, I know for several of you, it was very late. For several of you, it was very early. Uh, so I'd like to thank all of the speakers who took time to share with us today, as well as the participants who have joined us uh, from all over the world. We uh, hope this was a, a useful activity and a useful uh, time for to share experiences with one another and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, goodbye. Thank you, goodbye. Bye-bye.